Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's such a pleasure to be here with you tonight and our guest conductor, Maestro Yul Tommy, who is conducting one of the great choral works in the repertoire. And we're gonna take just a little bit of time tonight not only to talk about our distinguished maestro's um, history, his history with this work, uh, and also the work itself. So first of all, welcome, Maestro Tommy. It's a could pleasure you, to be here. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, your, your musical background? You were born in Israel and your training is there, but you've really been all over the world. But first of all, just a little bit about where you come from and, and your early musical development. I was born in a small kibbutz in Israel. Uh, not many people are aware what kibbutz is, but it's a, a very special communal life of village-like, where everyone share everything and earn the same amount of money. Perhaps the only place in the world where a true socialism is being practiced. It was established in Israel uh, at the, uh, the years of the establishment of Israel around uh, 1948, when the a country was established and before uh, many Jewish people came from Europe, from the diaspora, came to, to Israel and needed to gather together and to fight uh, not only the malaria and the diseases, but also the animosity of, of the neighbors. And uh, the form of kibbutz was something that helped them a lot to be together and to protect uh, their villages and to protect the, the country for that matter. And I was born uh, in, in Kibbutz Merchavia, it's a bit on the north of, of Israel. There were about 700 members in, in that kibbutz. Most of the people um, came just a few years before that from Poland and uh, survived barely the Second World War. Um, my parents were among them who came in 1936 uh, to Israel and uh, their parents wouldn't hear of coming to Israel, and of course they were all gone during the Second World War, so I didn't know what grandparents uh, are actually. But um, my father, who was a painter, um, I mean, his, his main love was uh, to paint uh, pictures, uh, he was also very talented in music. And so he became Mr. Music in this kibbutz and taught uh, music at the high school. And he was my first uh, teacher for piano. And at the age of nine, uh, I already gave my first recital in the nearby uh, town of Afula. And it was, I think, about at 15 when I discovered that as much as I love to play Beethoven sonatas for piano, I'm much more excited when I hear Beethoven symphonies. There was something about the richness of the orchestra sounds that uh, made me move my hands and head and body. And my father bought me uh, scores and I started to read scores and like all the kids uh, were reading books, mind you, this was a period when kids still read books, um, I was reading my scores and the, the overwhelming um, uh, just to, to realize the realization that I can read the scores and I hear the music in my head and enjoy it so much was uh, overwhelming. And it was when I went to the army, because in Israel everyone has to go at 18 to the army, I was able to connect it with studying, conducting at the Academy of Music in Tel Aviv. Uh, and there I studied for three years, received a scholarship in conducting and went to the Juilliard School 
and the rest is history. Do you still remember your first conducting experiences in front of an ensemble? I remember mine in college. I had to buy a lot of pizza and soda for my colleagues to make little groups together so that I could go through some of the most basic repertoire. But do you still remember now with that, such a storied career, uh, the first moments that you actually picked up the baton and led a group of musicians? Well, believe it or not, while I studied conducting in Tel Aviv, it was mainly just accompanying pianists because the school was small, the, the country was very poor, there was no possibility for me to conduct an orchestra. So when I arrived at Juilliard, um, I had to compete. There were 33 students that came to the class of Jean Morel, and we knew that only three would be accepted. And that was the first time that I've conducted a full, wonderful orchestra. I remember that some of my colleagues, like Pinchas Zuckerman, were was sitting in the first violin and, and playing, uh, and, and others, Miriam Fried. And I started to conduct the orchestra, and they sounded so beautiful. And then I, he I hear some knocking, and the teacher said, but Mr. Talmi, you have to work work with the orchestra. And I couldn't tell him that I, my English was so poor, I didn't know how to work with the orchestra. <laughs> and so I started to sing, and I said, do that. And they imitated me, and uh, apparently that did it. Uh, I also sang with the do re mi fa sol system, which is the system in, in France, and I'm sure Jean Morel, who was French, liked it very much. Uh, and so I was among the three students who were uh, accepted uh, to the class. You have a very interesting background that isn't as common now as it once was, uh, also as a composer, a celebrated composer. Uh, as a, and a conductor, of course, we know from history the Mendelssohns and the Mahlers were both celebrated composers and conductors, but it's not something that you find uh, commonplace anymore. How has your background as a composer helped your conducting and vice versa? How has your conducting helped your work as a composer? I compose since I remember myself just touching the harmonium. The first instrument that I played was not even piano because we couldn't afford piano. It was this small box that you pump the air with the pedals and, and play here. And I remember that since the first days, I immediately composed things and my father wrote the, the first ones when I didn't know yet how to write the music, and later on I, I wrote it myself. Um, I entered the Academy of, in Tel Aviv and also Juilliard in both majors, conducting and composition, and graduated uh, in both. Later on, uh, when I started uh, my career as a conductor, it is such a demanding, um, field and one especially young conductor needs to learn so much repertoire in order to stand with a professional orchestra and to know always better than the orchestra does. Uh, for a young conductor this is quite a challenge and so it took over of, of the composition. I, for some years I hardly wrote uh, anything else. When my career as, as a conductor was, was more established and I received already, uh, I mean, I, I gained some permanent positions where I felt safe now, then I returned to composition. And uh, just last May, I ended a 13 years uh, tenure with the Quebec Symphony in Canada where, by the way, I had to speak only French. English was forbidden. And so for, for the last concert, uh, which I conducted Beethoven Ninth as a farewell concert, we started the concert with my work called De Profundis, with text from uh, Psalm, for, from the Bible, for choir and, and orchestra, about a 25 minutes long piece. 
That was the last uh, work that I have uh, written. It's a very, very dramatic piece, but I'll perform it now in, in many other places. So you're performing tonight with the orchestra and chorus, one of these, these great works, one of the masterpieces of the repertoire. Uh, Haydn, of course, is a very undervalued composer in many ways, um, often overshadowed by Beethoven or Mozart. But this work comes from a later period where he found this, uh, this inspiration, this, this new vigor in life. And uh, after having served with uh, the Esterhazy court for so long, what was it, do you think, in, later, in Haydn's later life that led to this sudden burst of creativity, the sudden burst of energy where some of these great works came from? Well, Haydn uh, was uh, perhaps after Handel. They were two, the, the two German conductors that also made a, a very big name and career in England and they were very popular in England. Handel was, he became, they almost adopted him uh, not as a German but as an English uh, uh, composer. And most of the big oratorias like the Messiah, Israel and Egypt, etc., were performed mainly in London and always with a huge forces, with tremendous choirs. Haydn who had an impresario, Salomon, in uh, London, who commissioned from Haydn every time to write some symphonies when he came to London, and the public loved Haydn. He heard, uh, when he was already uh, a mature composer, uh, around uh, 60 years old, he heard a big performance of the Messiah, of which there were some 400 people on stage. In other words, we always think that the Baroque music is, was performed by a small ensemble of 15 players and, and a small choir of 20 singers. Well, it's not correct. Uh, there was this period of the big oratorios of Handel that were performed in London with tremendous forces. And Haydn heard it. And at that time, he knew that he is going to write an oratoria. It, it appealed to him, and he wanted to, to do something. Of course, he changed a lot in comparison to, to Handel. So he said it to his um, manager in London. His manager um, heard that there was a text that was handed to Handel about the creation, following the, the, the story of the creation from the Bible, but Handel rejected it, didn't dis decide that it, it's too big for him to do, to tackle, and Haydn took the challenge. He went back with a text to Germany, and he had a friend of his who was a, a noble person, Franz Vietten, and asked him to translate, to translate it to German. And they worked a lot on the text in, in Germany, and then Haydn started to write it. Haydn was about, I think, 66, uh, and in these, uh, those days, that was a very old uh, age for a composer. Um, as you all know, Haydn was born before Mozart, but when he wrote this, the, the creation, Mozart was already dead because he died so, so young. And so he wrote it in perf the performance uh, in, in, in Germany was a tremendous success. Now, you have to realize that at, the, at that time, there were no recordings, there were no radio broadcasts. And so it, all, it went by word of mouth people heard the piece and they started to speak about it. And it developed so fast that within a short while, any city that performed the creation for the first time, people were traveling days and miles just to be there. It was something that no other work at that period ever gained this popularity. 
So much so that it was the event uh, to be. Uh, we know that um, when it was first performed in Paris, for example, uh, the, the, one of the guests or the guest of honor was supposed to be Napoleon. And on the way to the world performance in Paris of this work, there was a, an assassination attempt of Napoleon, and he survived it and continued to the concert. Uh, he wouldn't miss it. Um, that was that we know that in other, in Vienna, when uh, it was performed, the performance was at seven o'clock at four people already were streaming to the hall because they were afraid they will not find uh, seats. Now, I, I will tell you another thing um, just for you to understand how popular this work was. Towards the end of his life, we are speaking now about 10 years after Haydn wrote it, uh, it was performed in Vienna, and Haydn was already ill. People knew that he will not survive uh, uh, very long, and everyone the, of, of the who's who in music in, in Vienna were there. All the composers, Hummel and, and Salieri, and, and, and of course Beethoven, came also, and Haydn was led <coughs> to the hall, the entire public rose and, and clapped and, and gave him a standing ovation. And at the, at the intermission, Haydn could not, uh, could not hold anymore, and he started to leave, and Beethoven came to him and took his hands and kissed his, his hands, and Beethoven was already quite known at that time. So that was a very uh, a moving uh, experience. Um, the performance there was a tremendous, uh, people could not leave the hall. They, they clapped for 20 minutes and no one wanted to leave the hall when it was over. And uh, half a year after that, uh, Haydn died. I must just add that when I was a child, when I was young, not, maybe not a child, I remember that the creation was performed every two years, every two, every three years. And all the great conductors like Leonard Bernstein, who came to Israel to, to work with the Israel Philharmonic, he conducted, I remember the creation conducted by Bernstein. Um, today, for some reason, it's a work that you can hear every 15 years by uh, orchestras. It's somehow forgotten and kill me if, if, if I understand why. Well, you mentioned already the text, and that has a very interesting story as well, because, um, of course, Handel wrote his uh, oratories in English, having lived in England. The English text for this was was lost, if I understand correctly, that um, Haydn didn't speak English very well at all. He was obviously much more comfortable with German. And you mentioned that you performed this work a number of times, but this is actually the first time that you performed it in English. Is that correct? That's correct. I've done it many times. It was always in, in German. And it was only some weeks before I came here that I was informed that actually the choir uh, and the soloist are singing it in English, and it was quite a shock for me. I should have, you know, I thought about it, but, and so usually I do mime the words when I, the choir is, is singing, and this time I'm unable to do it because everything that comes out of my mouth is in German. So, uh, but they sing nevertheless wonderfully in English, so they, they have no trouble. 
It provided me the opportunity to break my English, my German out after four years in captivity. It's a little broken, but it was, it's amazing that, um, you know, in addition to being a composer and conductor, uh, a, a wonderful linguist as well, my, my Maestro Tommy is. So the, the piece is fascinating because just like the works of Handel and many other great composers, he uses text painting quite often as um, the musical vocabulary shifts quite a bit. And, and at the very beginning, too, um, could you describe the, the sounds of, of what Haydn creates for chaos at the very beginning? The creation, it's really a description of the story of the creation of which at the very beginning, three angels, Raphael, Gabriel, and Uriel, are telling the story. It's a, uh, Gabriel is a soprano, Uriel tenor, and uh, Raphael, a bass, and the choir also it serves like a choir in the Greek tragedies that tells the story. Later on, towards the third part, it, it's been uh, written in three large parts, God already created Eve and Adam, and so Gabriel and Raphael exit, and instead of them, the same soprano, who was an angel before, she's now flesh and blood, she is Eve, and uh, Raphael is, is Adam. And there is a very long uh, love uh, duet uh, between them, and uh, the, the oratoria ends already when uh, the human beings were created. But coming back now to the very beginning, the opening, the music that Haydn wrote for the opening of the chaos, when there was nothing yet, I think these six minutes of music are of the greatest ever written in the history of music. Um, at times, you think that it's Wagner in that respect that one doesn't know in which tonality we are. Where are we exactly? And people in the orchestra seem to come in a wrong place. They don't play on ta, ta, but sometimes ta, ta, and on purpose just before the time as if they come in a wrong place because Everything is disorganized. Um, these six minutes, as I said, uh, I have every time that I conduct it, I have goose pimples. It's not to believe the greatest greatness of this music. Then comes Raphael and says that at, at the beginning there was nothing, there was void, there was chaos. And then he goes into, it's, it's very soft and, and in a way almost tragic. It's all in C minor. He described that the creation of light. And he said, let there be light. And the choir sings, and there was light. And when they say light, the entire orchestra burst with a tremendous loud C major chord. And the description is just unbelievable. I mean, you will hear it tonight. Uh, try not to jump from, from the chair. <laughs> it's, it's a very powerful thing. And people were talking months after that to, to each other at, at the time when it was created about how Haydn described the creation of light. Later on, there are many scenes, just to give an example, um, when he speaks about the first rise of the sun. And the orchestra starts from pianissimo, where the violins go step by step up every time. You, you almost hear the description of a sunrise, and the cello and, and basses go also in the, the different direction until the full light 
is there, um, which is so brilliant, and not very long after that, he describes about the creation of the moon. And instead of the violinists are starting now, the celli and basses are starting extremely soft from the low notes, and you see visually the moon rising uh, into the sky. Um, the, the piece is full of, of descriptions like that. Uh, I don't know how much time we have, but... Uh. Oh, that's wonderful, and you're in for a very uh, a wonderful treat tonight with Haydn's creation. And welcome to Buffalo, Maestro Tony. It's a pleasure. Thanks.